Uh, when they came out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. And Jesus said to him, You see these great buildings, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. Our passage for this morning from the Gospel of Mark offers us a glimpse into the mind of Jesus that I think we read all throughout the Gospel. Here we have Jesus coming out of the temple with his disciples in Jerusalem, and a few of the disciples, uh, we don't know if it was one of the named disciples later, or if it was just one of the kind of the fringe disciples, but one of the disciples um, uh, gets caught up in the beauty of the structure that they were just in. And the disciples uh, look at Jesus and say, would you look at that, Rabbi? Would you look at that? Would you look at that building? That building is just, well, that building is stunning. And I like to imagine that at this moment, Jesus stops in his tracks the way that my grandfather used to when I would let fly with a pronouncement, uh, a pronouncement that, while understandable given my age, clearly demonstrated that I hadn't learned anything that this great wise man of God had taught me. I imagine that Jesus stops in his tracks and turns his head and looks at the disciples, but they, oblivious to his face, continue look at that building jesus look at that building don't you think it's pretty jesus uh don't you think that building is pretty and it's in these moments that i want to pause and i want to uh, employ a phrase that i once heard once learned on a trip to alabama it's a phrase that i'm sure you have uttered or have had uttered to you maybe you've maybe you've uh just heard it but but here's the phrase bless your heart right? And you know what that means, right? You're an idiot. (laughs) After the first service, somebody who was in the first service came and said, where are you from? I said, actually, I'm from Tonganoxie, you know, over near Lawrence. She said, I could have sworn you were born and raised in Montgomery, Alabama. And my poor Midwestern ego did not know what to do with that, I got to be honest. (laughs) bless your heart. Even if Jesus didn't use the phrase, I'm sure that he had that look all over his face. And and I'm sure that that look was on his face as these disciples described the magnificence of the building that they found themselves in and and described the look on his face as he witnessed them being enlivened by this, this great big structure and all that it had represented. But Jesus, I'm sure, was wondering, are the disciples ever going to learn? Are they ever going to learn? It must have been hard to be Jesus. That's the understatement of the year, right? It must have been hard to be Jesus leading this particular group of idiots around, right? It takes a village to raise an idiot, y'all, okay? It, to lead this particular group around, particularly what they never seem to understand what he's saying. You see, all throughout the Gospel of Mark, and incidentally, this is, my, this is the reason why the Gospel of Mark is my favorite gospel. All throughout the Gospel of Mark, the, the, the disciples are consistently demonstrating to Jesus that they haven't learned anything he has taught them. Nothing. It, it's easy to pick on them, because in truth, they, but, but in truth, they should give us a lot of hope, and they should give us a lot of comfort, because we're a lot like them. Amen? Don't be shy. Bless your hearts. Don't be shy. <laughs> we are a lot like them. Even though they and we are consistently and constantly hearing from Jesus about what it is that he expects of them and us, it seems to go in one ear and out the other all throughout the Gospel of Mark. We are treated to the disciples learning various lessons about what Jesus thought was important Uh, My my favorite example comes actually a few chapters before the one that we just read today where James and John come to Jesus and they say to Jesus, Rabbi, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. Bless their hearts. (laughs) In that story, Jesus being the good teacher that he is, he teaches them a lesson about power and authority and he tells them that um, although the leaders of the Gentiles lord it over the people and that the great ones are tyrants, among them that the people of God do things differently it will not be so among you he says whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant who wishes to be first among you must become last for the son of man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life for the ransom of many and you may recall this is not the first time Jesus has had to teach this first will be last lesson 
seems to me, as I read the gospel, every single time Jesus teaches them something, there's another lesson to be learned right around the corner, and it's often the same one. The disciples are dense, so it should come as no surprise to us that our passage today gives us another opportunity to learn at their expense. You see, in today's passage, they've just come out of the temple, okay? They, they were sitting in the pews just like we are. They're singing the songs. They're saying the prayers in a beautiful sanctuary, a beautiful temple. And they had just come out of the temple. And while they were in the temple, their rabbi had been teaching them very, explicit, very explicitly, very pointedly, and making a great deal about temple rituals, about overt legalism. He taught them about clerical pride. He taught them about the ways that the temple contribution system wreaked havoc on the poor. This was the widow's might thing. And he was making a point to them about how the temple was wreaking havoc on the poorest of poor. And then they walk out of this temple. Five minutes later, they walk out of this temple and the disciples look at Jesus and say, would you look at that temple, Jesus? Isn't it pretty? Bless. Say it with me. Bless their hearts. Right, bless their hearts. I mean, you can't really blame them. Uh, by all accounts, Herod had rebuilt, King Herod had rebuilt, the, the temple had been destroyed at one point, and Herod had rebuilt a beauty of a temple. By all accounts, this structure was gorgeous. And I'm sure being the good Jewish boys that they were, the disciples looked at that grand structure that symbolized everything about their religious system, everything about their, their cultural reality, and they probably just got a little teary. I'm sure that nostalgia kicked in. Perhaps they remembered the stories that their parents had taught them about the history of their people. They knew the stories, like, like for instance, they knew the stories of the Maccabean revolt when other people came in and desecrated the temple and then the Maccabees came in and cleared everyone out and, and cleansed the temple and reinstituted traditional Jewish worship. They knew the stories of all the people that had gone before. They knew what that temple meant to generations and generations of Jews. They knew it. And so despite what their rabbi had just taught them five minutes ago, can you blame them for thinking that the temple was gorgeous? I got to admit, I can't. I can't. I can't blame them. I think I get it. I think I understand what they were feeling. You see, when I was ordained in the Presbyterian Church, I had just had an intense season of theological training. I knew and was well-versed in the history of Christianity in America. I knew the role that the Presbyterian Church had played in that history. I knew that, that our church played a significant role in the last century, the, the, the century that would eventually become known as the Christian century. I knew the stories of what had come before. I knew the stories of women and men who worked hard to proclaim the name of Jesus in the most faithful ways that they knew how. I knew that of the women and men who tried to do good work here in the country and around the world in the name of Jesus. I knew that. And, and this was despite the fact that I had also been learning about the changing worldviews of, of particularly North American Christians, that there was a postmodern shift happening in the thinking of many people, particularly in our country. Despite the fact that I was learning that a Pew study was going to come out and name the fact that while an increasing number of people love God and Jesus and the Bible and believe in prayer and heaven, they don't like us very much. Despite the fact that I was learning the insidious nature of what white privilege has been in our church, how it has shaped our church and continues to shape our church, despite all of this, I have to confess to you, I've spent a significant portion of my ministry looking at the edifice that is the 20th century Presbyterian church and then turning to Jesus and saying, would you look at that, Jesus? Isn't it pretty? Bless my heart. Bless my heart. Sisters and brothers, I think that the word of the Lord for us today is the same word that Jesus offered his disciples back then. It's all coming down. The way that Jesus said it, not one stone will be left here upon another. It is all coming down. Uh, later on in this passage, a few of the disciples are sitting across the way on a hill looking at the temple with Jesus. And they ask Jesus, they want to make clear if he really meant what he said. Now, incidentally, 
you will notice that when Jesus is very unclear and vague in the Bible, people think he's very clear. But when he's very clear, all of a sudden, maybe Jesus didn't mean what he said. Do you notice that? So these disciples want to make sure, now Jesus, did you really mean what you said? And he was very clear to them that there were going to be people who would come along and try to convince them and convince us that they are the ones God has sent to save this thing, to save this thing that we have been a part of. But Jesus warns them and warns us, don't be taken in by it. He tells them that they're going to hear all sorts of horrible things happening, the way the Bible usually says it. There will be earthquakes and famines and wars and rumors of wars. It's a, it's a poetic thing the Bible does. Earthquakes and famines, wars and rumors of wars. He says there's going to be horrible things happening, but don't worry. It is the birth pangs of the new thing that is being birthed. Now, I've never given birth, but I've watched four of them. It's a scary thing, y'all, right? It's a scary thing. And Jesus is saying, listen, it looks like it's going to be horrible, but don't worry. This is the birthing of something amazing. Friends, we are all invested in the life of our church, our denomination, our world. We've all seen the beauty of what our church, our world has been. But some pretty horrible things are happening. And we may want to advise one another, just strive, play nice, keep the peace. But we have to come to grips with the fact that Jesus might be right. And that even what might look like it's bad is actually something pretty good. Something pretty good. I spent much of my last year in a lot of places where it looks like things are pretty bad. I spent some time last year in Ferguson. I spent some time this week down in Columbia with the students. To an untrained eye, that looks pretty bad. But I got to tell you, you get down in there, that's some pretty good work that's happening. It looks horrible. It looks like earthquake, famine, wars, and rumors of wars, but it's actually the birth pangs of something pretty incredible. The stones are coming down. Not one stone will be left upon another. There is a new church and a new world being birthed. And Jesus is saying, get behind that. Get in line with that. Get involved with that. I don't know about you, but this passage, this Mark passage, kind of makes me want to grab a sledgehammer and help the old thing come down. Because I don't know about you, sisters and brothers, I am ready for the new church and the new world. Amen? Thanks be to God.